Coming up, a rare look inside the government's most mysterious agency. For nearly 50 years, what goes on inside these buildings has been known to only a select few. People who work in the intelligence profession uh, live in a world between war and peace uh, all the time. But now, for only the second time, the National Security Agency is opening doors that have been sealed tight. No place in the U.S. government has been a secret for as so long as NSA. The National Security Agency has long been the subject of rumors and controversy, mostly a result of its extraordinary secrecy. The NSA has a larger budget than the CIA, and a mission even more mysterious. The once invincible agency is coming under some fire, so officials of the NSA have started to talk. Join us for America's Most Secret Agency. This is Fort Meade, just outside of Washington, D.C., in suburban Maryland. It is the headquarters of the NSA, the National Security Agency. And if you don't know what this super secret agency does, or even that it exists, that's because the NSA wants it that way. In fact, among themselves, agency employees quip that NSA stands for no such agency. NSA has lived through secrecy like very few people have ever understood for uh, the last uh, close to 50 years. Um, no place in the U.S. government has been a secret for as so long as NSA. We are the keeper of the nation's secrets. Now that doesn't mean that nobody knows. Uh, it just means it's not public information. NSA employees operate in a culture of absolute secrecy. They are given polygraph tests as part of their lengthy screening process prior to employment. Computer files track their movements, even which employees carpool together. Bottom line, no one talks. NSA is far more secret than any other agency in the federal government here. If you look at the CIA, uh, uh, almost every director, deputy director, whatever comes out, ends up writing a book about the agency. But in the entire history of NSA, there has never been an employee who has written a book about the agency. When I came to NSA, one of my mentors, uh, he said something very telling to me, something that carried me through my whole career. He said, um, you're not going to be able to publish your work here, but you can become top secret famous. And I guess that's uh, sort of been the uh, quality that has sustained a lot of us, being top secret famous. There's a saying that says you are really mature in this business when you get as much satisfaction from keeping the secret as telling it. You make history quietly, silently, aware that your greatest moments, your greatest victories, if ever known at all, will be divulged only to generations many years from now. But with allegations of widespread mismanagement, charges that the NSA is violating American civil liberties, and an impending budget fight in Congress, the NSA is beginning to re-examine just how secret the agency needs to be. The NSA has struggled with this problem of, of how do we put the record straight without throwing away the the secrets that we're trying to protect. We are going to slowly, surely, and carefully tell the stories that uh, the citizens should know in order to restore their faith in what is being done and why it's being done. Why can't you tell the American people those things you can tell them, okay? I mean, it's one thing to draw the line and simply say, we don't talk about ourselves, we don't talk about our operations, and that's the end of the conversation. But there are, in fact, some things that we can say, some things we ought to say. In the very simplest of terms, they are the ears of the United States, listening from airplanes flying over combat zones and mobile satellite monitors on the ground. From somewhere inside the bowels of this building, called Ops 2, the NSA captures radar, radio, and television signals, as well as phone calls, email, faxes, anything that transmits a message from one person to another. We intercept communications of adversaries of the United States and attempt to turn that into wisdom for American policymakers and commanders. By the same token, 
we attempt to prevent other nations from doing that to the United States of America. That's what we do. It is called Signals Intelligence, or SIGINT, NSA language for intercepting secret messages, and it is the exclusive bailiwick of the National Security Agency. We acquire information, we determine its value, and we pass it on. The ability to do communications intelligence has saved lives, it has kept us out of war, it has shortened war when we've been in it. It's been absolutely vital, even though unknown to the American public, it has served them well in a hidden capacity. The mission of the NSA is threefold. First, get the message. Second, decipher it, either by translating it or by decoding it. And third, prevent foreign nations from doing the same. Employees of the NSA, therefore, like to think of themselves as the code breakers and the code makers. The business sucks you in. It engages you in a tremendous intellectual uh, battle. It's, uh, it's sort of like a uh, duel in the ether. And just who is the enemy on this information battlefield? It's a matter of what are U.S. national security concerns. It could be terrorists. It could be drug traffickers. It could be leaders of nations that we recognize very clearly as adversarial. There's also a question of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, getting in the hands of, I think we're calling them now, states of concern. It's those kinds of things that policymakers and, and military commanders want to know about. The people who pick what targets NSA has got to go after are people in other agencies, the White House, the Drug Enforcement Administration, or the Pentagon, or the State Department. These are the people that send the targets to NSA to eavesdrop on. But exactly what messages the NSA is intercepting and how they get them remains a closely guarded secret. It is as diverse as is the communications network that we're exploiting. So some of it's terribly pedestrian and very easy. And some of it is incredibly high-tech and almost heroic. And when the History Channel is admitted inside the NSA, only the second camera crew in nearly 50 years to do so, we are given a selective view. The tools of the trade demonstrated for us are under tight security. They've never opened the doors really to anybody in the past, and this is a very brand new experience. So they're not really sure how to do it or what they're... Uh, what they should open and what they shouldn't. The NSA does let us into one of the most secure areas of Ops 2. It is NSOC, the National Security Operations Center. In this room, NSA security agents monitor the nation's most critical security concerns, codenamed CRITIC. NSOC is like the central nervous system of the National Security Agency. Everything comes in there and everything goes out there 24 hours a day seven days a week and I describe it as on watch for the nation people who work in the intelligence profession uh, live in a world between war and peace uh, all the time worried about security and safety of Americans when the rest of America is worried about who's leading the National League East I've had times when you know I myself have worked in NSOC and I could be working as many as four crises at a time. Sometimes it's getting threat warning information to someone who is in harm's way to make sure they get out of harm's way and very quickly. Some days it's narcotic shipments that don't come into this country because of the work that we do, we keep that from happening. Some days sensitive negotiations may be going on that have real national security impact and we are supporting our delegation with information so that they understand the play behind the scenes. When you would read about a successful operation, whether it was Vietnam, uh, Somalia, uh, in the Balkans, you could conclude uh, that what you did the week before or the month before helped in that success. The NSA employs over 38,000 people, including all branches of the military, as well as civilians. All of them support the agency's primary mission of code making and code breaking. It's a highly refined science known as cryptology. Today we're going to learn about periodic polyalphabetic substitutions. 
For many of the NSA's new recruits, this introductory cryptology class is an important first step in their training. And down here, the letter R was enciphered to a V, as it was here. The science of cryptology has undergone staggering changes, and the NSA can legitimately claim credit for the most significant change of all. The NSA has been a world leader in computer technology since the 1950s. We gave the impetus to people like Seymour Cray to develop supercomputers. It is widely believed that the NSA operates the fastest, most powerful computer in the world. And although its storage capability and processing speed remain classified, experts agree it is considerably faster than the previous model known as the thinking machine, which could perform 70 quadrillion calculations in under five seconds. Our species now communicates in ones and zeros. And the job of, a, of an agency like NSA is to turn the ones and zeros into data, to turn the data uh, into information, the information into knowledge, and finally the knowledge into wisdom. This is the state of the art in modern cryptology, an art on which the NSA is founded when it is formed in 1952. But even before there is an official agency, code breaking and code making have a long history in America. You're looking at an agency that inherited uh, 2,000 years of activity uh, by many, many people in many walks of life, both amateurs and professionals, uh, that were interested in converting writing in the beginning into secret writing and to preventing people not intended to read that information from reading it. In the Revolutionary War, uh, cryptology was practiced by almost everybody. One of the best at doing this was a member of Congress, Robert Lovell from Massachusetts. Uh, his ability to solve British ciphers helped show that Lord Cornwallis, when he was uh, blocked up in Yorktown, was not going to get immediate rescue or reinforcement. This enabled Washington to redouble his efforts and win the battle. The ability to solve messages confirmed Benedict Arnold's treason. This code book, called a cipher reel, is used by the Confederate Army during the Civil War. The American Civil War was pivotal in communications because it was the first war where the telegraph was actually used by a world leader. Abraham Lincoln went to the War Department cipher room daily and ran the war. He loved it in there. He'd go in there to have meetings. He wrote part of the Emancipation Proclamation in there. And at the start of World War I, a small army intelligence force at Verdun takes cryptology to a new level. This was the first war with radio intercept. We had trained operators listening to German communications using French radios. The most outstanding army cryptologist of World War I is Herbert O. Yardley, who is named head of the first American communications intelligence organization known as the Cipher Bureau. But Henry Stimson, Secretary of State under Herbert Hoover, cuts the budget, believing the Cipher Bureau to be unprincipled, and puts them out of business. When he did so, he spoke the single most famous sentence ever said in the history of the world about codes and ciphers. He said, gentlemen, don't read other gentlemen's mail. Yardley, out of favor and out of a job, publishes a tell-all book about his life as a government cryptologist in 1931. It is entitled, The American Black Chamber. The book is a bestseller and an embarrassment to the United States. When Yardley submits a second book to his publisher, specifically about the Japanese codes he has broken, the government takes action. This was explosive stuff for the 1930s. The US government did not want to see it uh, published. It would have been a diplomatic embarrassment, uh, and the government impounded the manuscript. Although the Cipher Bureau is officially out of business, the government creates the SIS, the Signals Intelligence Service, the precursor to the NSA. Its head is William Friedman, considered the father of modern American cryptology. Under his direction, the SIS more than doubles its workforce in an effort to break enemy codes. In 1938, the Japanese diplomatic corps received a new cipher machine. They called it Secret Typewriter B. We called it purple, and we attacked it, and within a short time built our first purple analog. Sight unseen, never seen a purple machine, sheer analysis, built a machine 
that after the war we realized was a 100% duplicate of that machine. Not the way it looked, but the way it worked. So we were able to break all purple messages from September 1940 to the end of the war. It was called magic. Friedman said these people were his magicians. There are some who believe that purple messages deciphered by the SIS give the U.S. an early warning of the attack on Pearl Harbor. But because the SIS reports go to many recipients through a slow and antiquated mail system, the reports come too late. We will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. After the United States enters World War II, the SIS pours even more manpower into interception and code breaking. The uh, cryptologic services went on recruiting trips and most of the people that they recruited were women. They knew their male colleagues in college were giving up their college careers to serve their country. They wanted to make the same sacrifice and so they came to Arlington Hall or the Naval Security Station, worked on enemy codes and ciphers and they were good at it. One of their major successes is breaking a Japanese military code known as JN-25, giving the United States Navy a strategic advantage in the Battle of Midway. Our ability to read JN-25 enabled Admiral Nimitz to send his fleets where they were needed in the right position, knowing in advance what Japanese units would be there and what they intended to do. What was it that permitted us to win against incredible odds? Well, signals intelligence play a key role. The Battle of Midway was the first Japanese naval defeat in 300 years. In 1943, the interception of a JN-25 message enables the United States Navy to bring down Japan's Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, the mastermind behind Pearl Harbor. His itinerary was transmitted, uh, masked by the system we called JN-25. The American Navy solved it, read his itinerary, realized that one of his inspection stops was going to be close enough for American aircraft to intercept his plane. Admiral Nimitz asked how important was Yamamoto to the Japanese war effort? What would his loss mean? And they said it would be like losing you, sir. And that was convincing enough to Nimitz. On April 18, 1943, Admiral Yamamoto en route by plane to an inspection tour, was shot down over the South Pacific. During World War II, the Signals Intelligence Service works closely with the Government Code and Cipher School, England's equivalent of the SIS. Almost every battle of World War II, there was some connection with decrypted messages. It told us where the enemy was, how he was armed, and the hardest intelligence to get, what he intended to do. You're trying to find how the mind of the enemy works. And of course, the goal, the ultimate goal, was to try and find out what was going on at the highest levels of decision. But we also had to protect our own communications. The Bell Laboratories people created a machine called Sig Sally. Sig Sally was the first secure telephone system. It encrypted speech. Uh, it took a room full of electromechanical devices to do that. Uh, and today, you can get that same capability uh, into the palm of your hand. And they were deployed to places that you might expect in the uh, Prime Minister's war room in London and in the White House. In addition to SIG Sally, the United States has SIG ABBA, a machine used to encode strategic radio communications. The SIG ABBA is the little known success story of World War II. It was never broken. This machine used a rotor maze of 15 rotors, so complicated that the Germans and Japanese gave up even trying to break it. The Nazis, however, believe that they too have an unbreakable cipher machine, codenamed Enigma. The Germans trusted it implicitly. They thought it could never be solved by enemy code breakers. The possible permutations on that machine per letter are two to the 380th power. It's no wonder the Germans believed it secure, but thank God they were wrong. More than 20,000 employees are assigned to decrypt Enigma. 
and they do it by building, with the full cooperation of British intelligence, an electromechanical calculator called the bomb. As early as 1940, American cryptologists are decoding Enigma messages. This machine revolutionized the way you can attack a problem of huge numbers. And what it did was take the huge Enigma equation and minimize it and then give it like a brute force attack against that problem. The exploitation of Enigma-based communications provided information that was used in almost every battle against the Germans on land, on the sea, under the sea, and in the air. Just as important as breaking Enigma is keeping that fact a secret. For example, through Enigma-based messages, the Allies know every time a resupply ship is being sent to Rommel's forces in North Africa. Well, the Allies were having enough problems with Rommel. They didn't want him to get any stronger. They didn't want those ships to get through. But they knew that if they sank too many, the Germans would eventually uh, understand that we were exploiting their communications. So what the Allies would do is this. They would send out a reconnaissance aircraft to look for that ship. It would buzz the ship. The ship would radio for help, saying it had been spotted from the air, but too late. It was already, the submarines were there to sink it. But that kind of action misled the Germans into thinking it was good, aggressive military patrolling that was responsible for their ship losses, not broken codes. And the Germans had no idea we could break Enigma until 1974. They had complete confidence in a broken system, and therefore it cost them dearly. At the same time, Cryptanalysts at Arlington Hall are also decoding Soviet diplomatic traffic intercepted by American listening posts. The most important and the most difficult to break is a double encryption system, essentially a code within a code. In 1944, an army code breaker cracks the code. The decrypted messages are codenamed Venona. The Venona project revealed the existence of over 200 Soviet spies in the United States in World War II and the immediate post-war period. The messages reveal that as early as 1943, the Soviets have infiltrated America's Manhattan Project, the secret wartime effort to build the atomic bomb. According to the Venona decrypts, the most active agent in the spy ring is codenamed Liberal. The FBI uncovers Liberal's identity it is Julius Rosenberg. The world will not know until 1995 when the Venona documents are declassified the role cryptologists played in the nation's most notorious spy case. After the war, Eisenhower personally thanks the Army codebreakers at their headquarters in Arlington Hall in Washington. However, with no war to propel their efforts, many of the code makers and breakers return to their civilian jobs and went back to New York to work in a newspaper uh, because it seemed to me that my patriotic duty was to get off the payroll. It didn't seem like there were going to be very many threats. Well, obviously, that changed. The threat now is a strong Soviet Union surrounded by an iron curtain that the SIS has difficulty penetrating. They had uh, what they call Black Friday in the late 40s when they lost all their Soviet uh, code-breaking abilities. To make matters worse, the Soviets implement many surveillance techniques of their own. In 1946, Ambassador Abraham Harriman was at a dinner in Moscow, and these young pioneers, we'd call them Eagle Scouts, came up to him and said, Mr. Ambassador, we love the United States. We hand carved this great seal of the United States for you. We would be honored if you would hang it up for us in your office. And he did in 1952, quite by accident a surveillance team found that this thing had a microphone in it. So for six years, if you were in the office talking, the KGB was listening. At the same time, the Korean War overwhelms U.S. signals intelligence. The United States did dismally during the Korean War in terms of uh, code breaking. Uh, it was uh, not anywhere near the success that they had during uh, World War II. It was very pathetic. So after the Korean War, seeing the debacle that was made, Truman ordered an uh, investigation into how the system could be made a lot better. As a result of this investigation, on October 24, 1952, President Truman creates the National Security Agency by signing a secret charter 
that remains classified to this day. The NSA was formed in total secrecy. Only a handful of people outside of the agency even knew it existed for much of its uh, first decade. The ability to exploit communications is very fragile. If the word gets around that such and such a system is vulnerable, the country will change it and we will lose access to that information. The NSA's first director is Major General Ralph Kanine. He immediately begins hiring back World War II's best intellects to fight a new kind of war, the Cold War. I realized that there wasn't any job I was doing in New York that could ever be as fascinating or as meaningful as what I'd been doing uh, during the war. And the opportunity to continue this effort was irresistible. Uh, but by then, of course, the enemy was indeed the Soviet Union. And this posed a new and very difficult problem. NSA did not invent itself. Uh, it was invented because the world required it to be invented. During the 1950s, uh, Russia was totally black. Nobody knew what it had, what it was doing. And the United States was very fearful that there was going to be a nuclear attack by Russia. However, just gathering Soviet intelligence signals is a challenge. Eavesdropping planes are dispatched to fly just outside Soviet borders. These aircraft were under strict instructions to fly only on the friendly side of the border. They were not to intrude into Soviet territory. Unfortunately, in a large and vigorous program, some aircraft did stray into Soviet airspace. Now this was the most dangerous mission in the entire Cold War. Uh, more people died uh, by eavesdropping on the Soviet Union than any other way during the entire Cold War. They were never publicized at the time because it was so secret. Those who put themselves in harm's way to collect information are probably the most unsung of the unsung heroes of the United States. Inside the NSA, a memorial marks those who have given their lives while working for the agency, including James T. Davis. Davis, an army cryptologist, is dispatched to Vietnam in 1961, three years before America's full military involvement. His assignment, to locate Viet Cong guerrillas by honing in on their radio transmissions. But due to the characteristics of the Vietnam landscape, it was necessary to get relatively close to enemy transmitters to do this. On one of the missions that Davis was conducting, he was ambushed and killed. He is believed to be the first American casualty in Vietnam. All told, 152 NSA employees have been killed in the line of duty. It's not a safe business at all times, but it's an important one. Davis knew this, he accepted the risks, and unfortunately, he was called on to pay the ultimate sacrifice. All of us understand that, and Davis epitomizes that for us. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, the National Security Agency has one purpose, one single target, intercept intelligence from the Soviet Union. We were then very much aware that our insight into what was going on into this closed society was, as I say, totally unique. Tremendous resources are put into gathering communications from radar signals and radio transmissions using ground stations. And eavesdropping planes are now passing through Soviet airspace. A lot of the U-2 flights were, were uh, loaded up not with cameras, but with eavesdropping gear that would pick up signals that come out of the radar that are surrounding the missile bases. What has not really come out is how the United States almost forced a war with Russia at the time by sending these aircraft into Russian airspace, um, basically challenging Russia. To decode the flood of communications now coming in, the NSA hires thousands of mathematicians and engineers to work together to create decryption machines. It led the way in information technology, it led the way in computing technology, it led the way in storage technology, all because of its two basic missions, where it had to deal with large volumes of data and protect the volumes of data that it wanted to protect. That's the kind of edge in advanced technology that has happened at NSA over the years that I've been here. You get to see it early, 
you get to work with it early. Uh, I actually watch the information age unfold from NSA. The agency's history is marked by us being able to deal with every technological challenge that's been placed in front of us. We have done it, period. Early on, new decryption equipment aids in the decision-making surrounding the Cuban Missile Crisis. It helped the administration to understand the kinds of military goods that were being shipped from the Soviet Union to Cuba. And eventually, when President Kennedy established his quarantine line around Cuba, it helped the president to understand that uh, the Soviet ships were not going to challenge that line, that his quarantine was going to work. But the NSA's tremendous successes during the Cold War are not without a price. In 1968, an eavesdropping frigate, the USS Pueblo, is deployed to North Korea. The first mission of the Pueblo was to sail along the North Korean shore and eavesdrop on North Korean communications. They knew the U.S. was sending these spy ships over there. And North Korea was very unpredictable. So North Korea decided to take out their vengeance on the, uh, on the Pueblo. The North Koreans captured the ship, captured the equipment that was on board, and they captured the entire crew and were able to interrogate them for almost a year. It was a, a severe loss of cryptologic information and signals intelligence information to the uh, communist side. But the NSA has enough tools and techniques to weather the losses by Pueblo. By the time Richard Nixon is elected president, the NSA has 95,000 employees and is generating more than 1,000 intelligence reports per day. From 1952 to 1975, the NSA is allowed to operate with virtually no oversight. The NSA would uh, talk to a couple people in Congress, just a couple, and, and, and that was it. And the reaction from Congress was, we don't want to know what you're doing. Here's the money. Take it. Go do what you want. But in the mid-1970s, charges are made that the NSA is eavesdropping not only on foreign targets, but also on Americans. In 1975, the Senate Intelligence Committee convenes an official investigation into the NSA. Through those investigations, it was uncovered that NSA had been engaged in illegal domestic espionage for three decades. Um, and because of that, there were new laws to prevent NSA from um, doing this domestic espionage anymore. In 1978, Congress passes the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which makes monitoring American targets illegal without a court order. Throughout the 1980s, NSA refocuses its technological efforts on building bigger and better computers and its surveillance efforts on the Soviet Union. But that all changes in 1989. I was down there during the Cold War, and one by one, all of the Eastern Bloc countries fell. Now that's a fairly powerful experience to have, to be sitting down there knowing that most of your national security policy over the years has been built on your policy toward the Soviet Union, you have a very bipolar world, and you're actually sitting there watching history happen. When the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, the NSA is forced to revise its mission and begins to focus more on elusive targets like international terrorism and drug trafficking. Without a clear intent from a discernible threat like the Soviet Union, NSA's usefulness is questioned. Congress lowers the NSA budget and staff cuts are made. But at the same time that that discernible threat was declining, there was another discernible threat arising. The new threat is global technology. We now have the capability in this globally networked world for anybody, not just a superpower or a nation state with a large military, to reach into your society and to your infrastructure and do you harm. And they can do it for next to nothing. Because of the rapidly expanding use of computer technology in the private sector, the NSA's espionage equipment is no longer theirs alone. The world is catching up. Yesterday's mousetrap is uh, overcome uh, by tomorrow's mouse and then there's a new mousetrap built, and it keeps going and going and going. We're a nation blessed in many ways, but in, in terms of defense, 
uh, we're blessed by two large oceans on, the, on either coast. And so even, even in a world of uh, thermonuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, Americans felt a bit more secure than, say, their South Korean allies did, who were face to face with, with, with communist ground forces. And there's an awful lot of things now that are really important to America and Americans that are located somewhere in this cyber entity and are in this new place. That new place is vulnerable. Most of the history of the American nation has been working out security and liberty in physical space. And now we're about working out that formula in this new cyber domain. As the National Security Agency enters its second half century, it must retool and rethink its battle plan. I think it's important for the public to know that the uh, history of NSA has not stopped. It's not the end of NSA history. It's a very important turning point. Cyber war is a term that you hear today a lot. Uh, and the business we're in is to counter uh, the effectiveness of cyber warfare against our infrastructures. For example, uh, the power grids, um, the uh, airline air traffic control systems, uh, the rest of the transportation networks, the energy networks, uh, the health services networks, all of which have information that are critical to some segment of our society that are all today vulnerable given their global networking uh, to attacks by terrorists, criminal elements, hackers. We're trying to keep pace with a global telecommunications revolution that's being fueled by a multi-trillion dollar global telecommunications industry. So change has a completely different meaning for us now. It's, uh, the tempo has really picked up. For example, at the height of the controversy between Iraq and the UN Arms Control Inspection Team, Saddam Hussein is communicating with his ministers using a mobile telephone that operates on more than 900 channels. Each channel is separately encrypted. The global water level of encryption is rising. There's just more out there. It's just a tremendous explosion of volume. And with this explosion, key communications are slipping through the cyber cracks. In 1998, India detonates its first round of nuclear tests. All the billions were paying for, for NSA. They completely overlooked that. They completely missed it. So um, if they missed that, then, then maybe they're missing a lot of other things. To reduce the number of near misses, NSA is now pouring a significant portion of its budget into new software that can better intercept and decrypt the billions of phone calls, faxes, and emails that encircle the globe daily. But just how much they're spending remains top secret. We're not going to tip our hand relative to our adversaries and invite them to go after technology area X because they see us investing in that technology. There is evidence that among the NSA's newest inventions is a computer program codenamed Echelon, software the NSA shares with the intelligence agencies of other nations. With Echelon, the NSA has developed a way to search for key words and phrases like terrorism or bomb and cull those messages out of millions that may affect national security. They don't talk about Echelon because any kind of uh, technology that actually shows how they eavesdrop on foreign countries is still forbidden for NSA to, to say to anybody. A lot of Americans are worried that the age of eavesdropping on the U.S. may be returning. You have technology that can pick up enormous amounts of communications from uh, tremendous amounts of people all over the world, including U.S. citizens. They have the technology, but is the NSA violating the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, prohibiting unreasonable search and seizure? I'm here to tell you we don't get close to the Fourth Amendment. Uh, we, for better or for worse, uh, stay comfortably away from that line. I don't think NSA is illegally spying on U.S. citizens um, like they were in the past. However, there are still some worrisome loopholes. Technology has far surpassed what the laws are.
But the NSA insists that the American public's concern over civil liberty violations is unfounded. It's really important that the American people understand what we do, that we are, in fact, a relatively powerful organization, and it's absolutely critical that they don't fear the power that we have. I really think the public understands that there are vulnerabilities in our current way of life. Uh, and I think they're very anxious to have somebody make those vulnerabilities go away. Really what you have in here are a bunch of Americans that are safeguarding Americans. And I believe in my soul that this is the most trustworthy group of Americans I've ever seen. In January of 2000, many of the NSA's most powerful computers suddenly lost all power and were down for three days. Intelligence experts interpreted the disaster as one more sign that the agency is in dire need of modernization. The magazine U.S. News and World Report recently studied the NSA and concluded that the agency is no longer on the cutting edge of technology. Agency officials maintain they're up to the challenge of modernizing and vow to continue their mission of protecting America's national interests.